Listen up everyone, Rome Total War Remastered is out, and whether you've played the original or not, you need to pick this game up. Let's not waste any more time and talk about why. Rome Total War is a strategy game that was released in September of 2004. It was developed by Creative Assembly, published by Activision, with the rights later transferred to Sega, and marked the third entry in the Total War series after Shogun and Medieval. It was a phenomenally influential entry in the series as it marked a major graphical jump from 2D sprites and somewhat static world maps to glorious 3D models and more dynamic animations. This may not be as impressive today, but you have to take yourself several years back when 3D games had only just found their footing to the extent and level of quality we see today, and here comes this game with grand scale battles featuring thousands of soldiers on screen at a time. As such, this game was a tremendous success, and has become many people's favorite Total War game as a result. Including myself, though I have yet to play any of the others, so take that with a grain of salt. Still, it stands to let you all know my personal connection with this game. I first got it as a present from my uncle around 2010 or so, and played it a fair bit before I lost the disc a few years later. Around 2018, a YouTuber by the name Two Clicks Philip would make a video on the game, which is really good and you should watch it, that would rekindle my interest in it. I bought it on Steam the same week, played it non-stop while finishing graduating high school, and was absolutely in love with it. To this day, I now have over 300 hours in the Steam version, making it my most played game through that service, and I consider it one of my overall favorite games to date. As in compared to all the games I've talked about on my channel up to this point, it'd probably be second behind Dragon's Dogma. Now, in 2021, the team at Creative Assembly has released a remastered version of the game, which fortunately released right between my spring and summer semesters, so I've basically turned into a vampire these past few weeks. Disturbing lack of vitamin D aside, I felt compelled to talk to you all today about this game, explaining what the gist of it is to new players, going over what the remaster does right as well as what could be better, and lastly covering why I said at the beginning of this video that this game was highly worth a pickup. Additionally, I'll offer some tips and advice to new players to hopefully ease you into this game. Alright, it's clear there's a lot to cover, so without further ado... <gasps> Hey, what is up everybody? This is Blacklight, and welcome to Rome Total War. So first off, let me go a little more in depth for new players what Rome Total War is about. As I mentioned before, this is a strategy game, but you may notice from the footage in the background that it plays a lot differently from other strategy games you may be familiar with. That's because the Total War series differs from most in having a large scale map with several different regions, territories, settlements, factions, armies, agents, and so forth. Your goal in this game is simple, conquer large expanses of territory and crush any nation that stands in your way of global domination. You achieve this by building armies, battling enemy nations, besieging their settlements, sending fleets of ships to blockade their ports, and so on. On top of engaging the enemy in open arms, you're also responsible for the governing of your own settlements, with constructing new buildings, managing taxes and income, maintaining and growing your nation's finances, negotiating trade routes, forging alliances with other nations, basically acting as a cutthroat politician, only leaving the actual throat cutting to your assassins. All these actions are done in turns, with limitations on recruitment, construction, unit movement distance, and more. After you've done all you can or want to in a turn and end it, the other AI-operated factions will make their own moves, allowing you to interact with any requiring a direct response from you, such as a diplomatic proposal or an enemy attack. Then, at the start of your next turn, you're given reports on important things that took hold in the time between and repeat the process. Now some of you might be thinking, sure, this sounds fun and all, but I thought this game would be more action oriented. The series is called Total War after all. Right you are, my friend, which is where the second half of this game comes in. Whenever you fight an enemy army or take part in a siege, the camera zooms into the battlefield and transitions into a two-scale battle map where your entire army is present and ready for your orders. Here you form your army's battle lines and attempt to defeat your opponent either by slaying them down to the last man, or more efficiently, breaking their spirit and routing them. These battles are some of the most intense and grand scale from any game I've played to date, and especially on harder difficulties, they test your ability to strategize and adapt to different tactics and situations on the battlefield. 
It makes the game incredibly fun and engaging, as well as providing a solid built-in defense to avoid overplaying, as the level of critical thinking required may slowly turn your brain into mush. So these two halves of the game provide an addictive and highly stimulating experience in this game's campaign mode, with the world map gameplay testing your management, preparation, and long-term planning skills, and the battles requiring you to think strategically and critically under, at times, extreme pressure. That's the main selling point of Rome Total War, but there's another element to the game that I'd consider an important feature, and that's the family tree. In this game, you have several named members of your faction that are either direct descendants of, married in to, or were adopted by the noble family bloodline that leads your chosen faction. Each of these individuals has their own traits with selective strengths and weaknesses. These primarily affect three main stats. Command, which has an effect on damage, armor, and morale of units they lead in battle. Management, which affects how much income is generated by a settlement they govern. And influence, affecting their diplomatic standing and effect on public order for settlements they govern. Now, many of you have seen my videos before I take it, and you know a common theme in my favorite games is the ability to forge entirely unique stories based on unscripted sequences. Sure, I love when games have set stories or set pieces that mirror the creator's intentions. That's why I love the Halo series and my favorite genre is hack and slash games. However, when elements of a game come together to provide an entirely unique experience to you, it often leaves you with stories that are far more personal and resonate with you as an individual. I feel like you'd be able to do that already with this game just because of its freeform nature, where you just have a single goal and achieve it however you deem best, but the inclusion of these named generals governors, and family members gives you characters to become attached to, or ones from opposing factions to develop a rivalry with. It's ingenious, and for me, separates this game from a fun, challenging experience to a gateway for creating memorable, engaging stories full of heroes, villains, plenty of conflict, and often bittersweet endings. Want an example? You best believe I've got one. Sit back and enjoy as I share with you the tale of Manius and Cornelius. It was a cold winter night when the siege began. Endless hordes of crudely armored, barbaric soldiers marched upon the gates of Massilia. It was an invading force, men united under a common banner, the Banner of Gaul. There were far too many for the poor garrison of Romans in Massilia to hold back this horde. Months passed, then years, as the siege held and the Romans stationed there lost faith they would ever see a new dawn. That's when they came. A vast horde of cavalry swept down from the hills and drove the horde of Gauls away from the town, leaving no survivors in their wake. After the chaos of battle had seized, the Lord of Massilia would thank the man who led this charge, only to learn they were hardly more than a boy. Despite that, there was much strength in this boy, a fiery determination in his eyes to spread the might of Rome across the land. When asked, the boy would give his name, Manius Julius. After this victory, Manius would lead the armies of Rome throughout their northern expansion. As he grew, more battles would he fight, and for every one of them, a similar fate befell his enemies. Not one survived. He would soon become married and grow vast amounts of fame for his deeds. In his twenties, he had conquered the legendary Gauls, and only a short while after that, he brought an end to the equally feared Carthaginians. Many would see his victories as a prelude to much fame and fortune, yet while Manius gathered much fame, his life would never be labeled as fortunate. Despite his standing with the soldiers of Rome, the senators of Rome feared him and refused to offer him a seat at their table, despite the many spoiled relatives of Manius who would be granted such an honor. His wife had proven wicked and greedy, and had grown famous for her lack of faithfulness to him. Even further famous was his inability to find a successor. After decades of attempts, Manius would only have one child, who he named Cornelius. And Cornelius, unlike his father, was a coward and did little for the people of Rome. Further still, Manius had little intelligence despite his privileged education, and though he lived well into his fifties, could never find a calling in life beyond one, his ability to conquer. Manius would lead Rome's armies in many more wars, defeating other nations such as the Spanish and the Britannians. When at last it seemed he had the chance to retire from his endless days of command, bringing the deaths of tens of thousands of warriors in his lifetime, he was robbed of it 
when the peasant folk of a formerly Britannian city rioted in the streets, breaking into his home and executing him. It seemed fate was against Manius throughout all his life, and despite his greatest attempts to be an important figure in history, he would only ever be known for his bloodshed. Or at least, it seemed as such. When Galerius Julius, newly elected leader of the Julii family, began conspiring to stage a coup of the Roman Senate, he requested the aid of Manius' son Cornelius, under the guise he might carry some of the might and combative brilliance of his father. Cornelius, as stated, was notoriously cowardly, and despite agreeing to aid in the coup, hid behind his men and fellow generals, allowing them to die in his stead. Despite this, the coup was successful but the other Roman families prepared to go to war with them. This is when a miracle occurred. Some say the success of his friend Galerius inspired him, while others more spiritual believe the soul of his father had become one with him. Whatever the case, a long dormant side of Cornelius would awaken, and no longer was he known for his cowardly, pampered status. He had instead become known as a grand figure in Roman history, embodying everything his father was and more. Cornelius would bravely lead the Julii family to victory against the other families, and while the other generals he had fought beside would each fall before seeing the fruits of their labors, Cornelius would see the war through to its bitter end, and when all was said and done, retired in the grand city of Carthage. Many watched in anxious concern that Cornelius would suffer an abrupt ending like his father, but nothing would happen as such. Cornelius lived several years, even into his late 70s, enjoying an era of peace and prosperity with his loving wife always beside him. Eventually, his years would catch up with him, and Cornelius Julius would pass away peacefully in his sleep, reuniting with his father and bringing honor and glory to their names to be remembered long after their time. And that is the tale of Manius the Great and Cornelius the Brave. So, if such a story could happen just from my own experiences with this game, imagine what yours could be like. Convinced to give this game a shot now? Well, good, cause you've got some options. <laughs> While everything up to this point has been well worth sharing, the main point of this video is in regards to the newly released remaster. The original game, though solid, has a few problems today due to advancements in software and hardware, and as a result, a remaster is a fantastic way to get new people into the series. But what about veterans? It's time we answer that question by taking a closer look at the pros and cons of Total War Rome Remastered. Which is such a stupid name. Seriously, the original was called Rome Total War. Just call it Rome Total War Remastered. It just flows better, for crying out loud. I mean, really? We've... Alright, I'm gonna cover this stuff quick, so fasten your seatbelts. We're jumping to ludicrous speed. Get it? First up, graphical changes. As the original game was heavily influential in this aspect, it's important they get this right for the remaster. And personally, I'd consider the end result here to be... Pretty good. As someone who's only played these two games in the series, the stark jump in visuals is fantastic, with vibrant colors to both the world map and battlefields making everything really pop. I wouldn't consider it as visually engaging as the original was for its time, but I do like the additions to the soldier models in battle. The features and expressions of each are varied, already a testament to the evolution from the original to this, but I was an even bigger fan of the effect on the models over time. With the original, the only real visual sign that a unit of soldiers was exhausted is that they move slower than before. Now though, you see soldiers' shoulders slumped, try saying that three times fast, and their feet drag as their weapons hang low. Similarly, in rain or other harsh weather, you'll see patches of mud coating the unit's armor. It's really cool, and makes battles more dynamic. There is a problem with all the enhancements though. The purpose of them is to bring this game up to the standards of the current ones, but it's lacking a huge later addition, specialized combat animations. I've seen plenty of clips of Total War Shogun 2, in which every unit on screen engages with one another in a stylish, dynamic animation, and it looks phenomenal, in part with the added blood decals and disembodiment. I know a guy who would love this. 
and they know who they are too. While this game enhances the visuals, it does not update the animations. So the drastic difference requires a good amount of dispension of disbelief, which I'm willing to give as a longtime Lotro fan, but it's still worth mentioning. Plus, I suppose it might help with performance, as we get to what is arguably the nicest thing about this remaster. It's playable. As much as I love the original, I don't have as many options to play it, but with the frame rate dragging unreasonably on my Predator laptop, and my desktop running it a little better, but with lower specs and a chance of spontaneously crashing. The remaster, on the other hand, ran super consistent, with few if any frame drops and solid performance on high settings. I can't show this as a record in 30 frames per second, which you can chop up to Premiere Pro's awful playback lag, but take my word on it, it runs good. Unfortunately, I did notice a few issues with game crashes, another issue with playing the original these days. It wasn't as bad as in that one, and seemed to get better the more I played the game, but it's still worth mentioning. I also found a consistent and glitch with it. 90% of the crashes I had resulted from quick loading after an auto resolve, but I took that as a defense mechanism against save scumming. I had stuff to do, okay? Don't judge me. The last thing on performance I want to bring up is the issue of loading screens. They are long. Oddly enough, like the crashing issues, they got much better as I played more of the game, but I can't say for certain if that's from the game patches or something else. Anyways, let's get back to the presentation, where I have a little nitpick regarding the speeches before battles. In the original, the speeches were insanely good at pumping you up for the battle at hand, and even helped affirm the character traits of each general. Today, the carrion birds feast, but they will feast upon our enemies, not on good Roman flesh! With the remaster, they're still here, and I like them the same, but there's a delay before the cheering that can make some moments super awkward. Let this be a day for triumph! Luckily, the soundtrack is untouched, and I couldn't be happier. Rome Total War is one of my favorite soundtracks of any video game to date. As you may gather from the background music of this video, the soundtrack for this game is exciting, fitting for both halves of the game, and captures the cultures and time period of the game while somehow being distinct from other soundtracks representing the same time period. Lastly, in regards to presentation, let's talk about the UI changes. Yeah, this is the hot point of contention for fans of the original, and I can see why. It's drastic and feels less fluid to navigate. With that said though, I kinda like it. It meets the graphical improvements the rest of the game offers, and requires flipping through far less windows, which I appreciate and see being better for new players than the old UI. I know I'm gonna get some flack for this, and I recognize its flaws, but I can't really list it as a pro or con for this game at the current point in time. An additional thing that could use some improvement though is the new voice lines for diplomatic interactions. A most generous proposal. They're not terrible, but feel like an unnecessary inclusion and display a massive contrast to the quality and audio consistency of the original voice lines they keep. Noble Master? Personally, I'd prefer the game without them, but I'll live with that. Okay, that's it. I'm out of negative things to say, because everything else with this remaster I'm 100% on board with. While we're on the subject of diplomacy, I like that in this game, it actually matters. A new option to request or offer compensation for past grievances to a faction helps smooth negotiations or conflicts, and in general, NPC nations are more responsive to ceasefires, alliances, requests for military access, and will even agree to or propose becoming a protectorate, which is far easier than what it took in the last game. I've got 10,000 armed soldiers at your gates and 100,000 in army. Join my crew or I'll split your labor! There's also new tools, such as percentage meters for the reputation level of both factions in discussion, as well as their general relationship with one another, and best of all, a text field indicating whether your proposal is too generous, too demanding, or reasonably fair, keeping you from deranking diplomats just from trial and error like you'd have to in the original. In general, diplomacy just works so much better, and I'm 
grateful for him. Speaking of AI improvements, as a whole, the AI in this game seems smarter than before. Of the three campaigns I played for this, I told you I spent too much time with it, even if two were short ones and I never finished the long one. One was on hard difficulty, and the other two are on very hard. As a result, I found myself tested quite a bit, and was surprised at how well a strategic error or exposed position on the world map resulted in a swift, and at times even brutal, counter move. It was like playing chess with a computer, but I eventually won, so actually no, that analogy sucks. And lastly, regarding the remaster, we have two new things I consider pros to the game. One is a small addition, but still a pretty cool one. Merchants. Originally, when it came to agents in this game, you had diplomats for negotiating with other factions, spies for keeping track of enemies' whereabouts and helping infiltrate enemy settlements, and assassins for sabotaging key settlements or killing generals, governors, and other agents. With this game, you also have merchants, which you can place near resources seen on the world map. Here, they generate income based on the value of the items in question, and can buy out other merchants to set up monopolies. It took me halfway through my second campaign to figure out how exactly this worked, but once I did, I liked it a fair bit and find it to be a cool new feature. And last, but not least, is the playable factions. The original Rome Total War had 11 playable factions, with the three Roman families available from the get-go, and all others unlocked by either defeating them, or finishing a campaign as one of the others. That said, some quick and simple tampering with source files could allow you access to the other 10 in the game, including the Senate and Rebels. The remaster decided to streamline that though, and instead make every faction apparently playable, except the two I just listed because, frankly, they're weird. And that concludes my points on what the remaster does well and what could be improved. That leaves one question left though. Is this game worth picking up? Well, I kinda answered that at the beginning, didn't I? Rome Total War Remastered may not be the best remaster, but it accomplishes what it set out to do and provides an opportunity to bring about new fans of the series. Plus, most flaws this game has are easily fixable through patches, which I don't like using as an excuse, so I bring this up rather because it poses an interesting option. If you're someone who owns the original game on Steam and loves it, I leave you to decide on whether this game is worth picking up. I recommend you keep the following in mind. Until the end of May, anyone who has a copy of the original on their account can get the game for half off, or $15, which is a remarkably good deal for a game of this caliber. As such, it's up to you to choose. Do you want to pick this game up now while it's certified cheap, that way you have it available whenever you're interested, or do you want to wait and see how many issues are fixed, then buy it at full price, or be at the mercy of Steam sales, which are frequent enough but may not offer as good a deal while the game is still considered a fresher item on the storefront. Either way though, as I said, I will let you come to your own conclusion. As for new players interested in picking this up, I can't recommend it enough. $30 is a solid deal, especially when you consider if the remaster's changes don't work for you, then the original and all of its expansions come packaged with, meaning you are guaranteed a good game. Only one thing remains to be discussed. I know this video is getting long, but I also know and hope that some of you are interested in picking up at least one version of this game. With how much there is to it though, it's possible that you may feel overwhelmed at first. To help, I would like to offer some tips and advice based on my own experience with this game to help you overcome that newcomer hurdle. With that said, listen up, because this might save your life. First things first, if you've finished the tutorial and are unsure who to pick when starting out with this game, I recommend you choose the Broody Eye family and select the checkbox to play the short campaign. This will provide you an opportunity to learn several of the basic mechanics of this game while offering plenty of room for error. It's also lots of fun, thanks to how much easy money you get to work with, and lastly, it's comparatively short. So if you focus on the requisites for victory, you'll soon have access to play any faction of your choosing, not just the Roman. Someone on the subject, my second tip is specifically for the Roman factions, as it will be everyone's first. When playing as them, you're given several missions by the Senate that offer rewards for taking specific settlements, blockading ports, or other requests. 
These can help you figure out what to do next, but should also be recognized as mostly optional. In fact, sometimes it's better you ignore a Senate's mission and do your own thing. As long as you do them often enough that the Senate doesn't start causing you problems, which is generously not too often, then you'll be fine. Meanwhile, a more all-encompassing tip, quick save often. You can do this quickly by pressing Ctrl and S, and it's very important. Aside from just the issue of potential game crashes, it's also nice when reaching the mid to late stages of longer campaigns, as you may forget to do something you intended on doing to deal with an issue. Trust me, this happens a lot more often than you think. I'd also consider it excusable if autoresolve screws you over from a certain victory that you didn't have time to do manually, but this could be argued as save scumming, so tread cautiously and use proper judgment. Speaking of auto-resolve, I was gonna say don't use it, but instead I'll advise you to label it as a dangerous tool. It's good to use for battles you're confident will result in victory that seem tedious or aren't significant enough to manually oversee. It also can be used if you have limited time and don't know if you can play a full battle, because that is a legitimate concern with this game sometimes. However, auto-resolve has a legacy of turning clear victories into defeat or having illogical consequences like a random building being damaged in a siege or a general dying for no reason. On the topic of battles, here's some advice for the ones you do take control. Of. First, recognize the two key elements that result in victory, army formation and unit morale. Morale has an even greater effect for win conditions than just outright killing every single enemy, as breaking the spirit of the entire army can force them to retreat, marking the battle as a win for your army. As such, it's good to implement tactics that maintain your unit's resolve while crushing the enemies, and that's where formation comes into play. Effectively placing your units can strain your opponent's forces and allow you to better capitalize on their mistakes or break their own lines. Mini tip, if you have multiple units selected, you can press the G key to group them up. From there, if you click the padlock symbol, you'll lock them in their current formation, making it easier to move them around. You can also make sure they face a certain direction by holding right click and dragging across the screen, rotating their position, and altering the dimension of space a single unit takes up. Lastly, in regard to hotkeys, you can hold the spacebar to see a unit's projected location information, letting you better line up adjacent ones. As a final tip for combat, note that every unit type has a different method of approach and can be effectively countered using the right methods. A freebie since they gave me a lot of trouble is hoplites, or similar units of spearmen that move in a phalanx formation. They're near impossible to defeat in a charge, but use projectiles to draw them out and flanking maneuvers to attack them from alternative angles, and they'll crumble pretty quick. Now these tips are to help achieve victory in battle, but sometimes it's best to bide your time before attacking, most notably when it comes to sieges. Of everything I'm sharing today, this is the one piece of advice I struggle with the most. But truth be told, sometimes it's better to maintain a siege for a prolonged period than actually lead the assault. This exhausts the enemy's resources and forces them to come to you, which assures your chances of victory. Plus, it's also funny. Like when I did this to the Carthaginians and they ran out one at a time just to die. I can't make a joke about this. It's funny enough as it is. Now comes a few tips for management and agents. In general, every type of agent in this game, as I discussed earlier in this video, have their own valuable uses, but none compared to the importance of diplomats. These characters can completely change how the game works if you use them properly, and one of the best uses for them is to travel the world and find other factions to establish as trade partners and gather map information from, which they usually will provide in exchange for your own map information. Both of these things will help you immensely with finances and knowledge of other faction statuses, so make sure to do it. Speaking of finances, your best friend in managing your faction is the Financial tab. Accessed by clicking the Denari counter on the top right in the remaster, or just pressing the F key in the original. This shows a block of stats related to your sources of income and any expenses incurred. At the bottom is your projected profits, which can serve as a pretty solid budget for how much you can spend on construction, recruitment, and so forth. If it's in the negative or on the border, you may want to cut spending in a couple areas. Finally, my last tip is kind of silly, but worth hearing out. Pay attention to the tips on the loading screens. They have several useful tidbits, including some of the things I said here, so keep an eye out for them. Hopefully these tips will be of help for you, and equally, I hope that you check this game out, as I can guarantee that most of you will be satisfied with it.
As for the video, I should probably call it since I've covered everything I wanted to, and it's about twice the length I intended on it being. That should be fine though, right editor me? I hope you never have children. Okay, well, that's gonna be it for this video. Hope y'all enjoyed. If you did, be sure to slice that like button in half, subscribe to my channel if you are new, and let me know in the comments what you thought. I'd like to know that these longer videos are still fine with you guys, so whatever your thoughts are on them, I'd appreciate the feedback. Once again though, hope y'all enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.